Welcome back to the show, everybody. Check out these headlines. Enbridge just got a lot more serious, ladies and gentlemen. And James Wallace said, stop thinking like a loser and start thinking like a winner. I can't say it any better. Somebody roll that beautiful intro. Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show, everybody. You can follow us on Twitter, YouTube, and digperspectives.com for exclusive content. Right now, $2.54 trillion market cap for crypto. The market is flat right now. $66,800 plus for Bitcoin, $3,000 plus for Ethereum, $111 plus billion market cap for Tether. And number eight is where XRP is after sliding down one spot. Uh, 51 cents, we're off by 0.6 in the 24 hour, up 1.1 on the seven day. The range of price is between 50 and 52 cents. We'll keep an eye on it. Ladies and gentlemen, link to, come on in, the best private equity in the world. I know you think you probably don't qualify, but if you just sign up and register, you'll find out just how easy it is to qualify. And you'll also find out just how smooth it is to hook up your account so you can fund your account and buy private equity. I guarantee you, if you've not signed up and registered and funded your account, you can do it in five minutes or less. There's no question. It's that simple. No question. Make sure you check out the link to my sponsor for the best home for private equity. I'm reminding everybody once again, very quickly here, XRP Ledger Apex 2024 is going to be in Amsterdam. Who doesn't want to go to Amsterdam? I know I do, but I know my schedule is not really allowing for it right now. But it's June 11th through the 13th. This is going to be a remarkable event. I'm encouraging everybody who can go to go. You won't believe what you'll learn. I went to 2022 Apex in Vegas, and it was remarkable. And I encourage all of you to uh, get a ticket and go find out for yourself all the amazing people and things that are being built right now on the XRP Ledger, and you don't even know about it. Right here we see XRP Ledger Q1 transactions top uh, 251 million with mixed overall performances. Transactions in Q1 jumped 108%. How about that one? We went over the Q1 report over the weekend. You could find that video in the playlist. And don't forget that right now we're looking for a full floor vote in the House of Representatives for FIT21. This is the Financial Innovation and Technology for the 21st Century Act. And shout out to James Metal Lawman Murphy for this one. He says, yes or no on FIT21? Yes, join dozens of countries in the EU in adopting clear rules and regulating the digital asset economy. No, take the position that a 1946 Supreme Court case about orange groves provides all the guidance necessary for regulating digital assets in 2024. Simple. He's absolutely right. We need that fit 2020. We need that fit 21 uh, act to pass. No question about it. And this could put Gary in the quiet column, right? We could quiet him down. Now I want you to listen to because you know, there's a lot of people out here that have carried a narrative that say Ripple's failed, financial institutions aren't going to use this stuff, and listen, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, you know, but the reality for me is, is that it's exactly here as Matthew Lemurl says, I want you to listen to what he says right here. This is the truth. And this is the punchline of that report, um, and it's a shock to many people because the press would have you believe and many of the CEOs of these uh, companies would have you believe that they don't need this new technology. But in practice, uh, they're all deploying it as quickly as they can. And uh, so that starts with Larry Fink and BlackRock at the top of the pile. All of the Chinese banks have now done so as well. And you can look at someone like JP Morgan Chase at number eight or Goldman Sachs at number 15, uh, where they are talking out both sides of their mouth. So their CIOs and CEOs are saying, uh, we don't need any of this. But their organizations are rolling it out and making it available to their customers. And you have to ask the question, you know, why are they speaking out both sides of their mouth at the same time? Well, the reality is they're very smart strategists. So they know uh, they haven't been ready. Uh, now they are ready, uh, but they also want to hedge their bets. And they have good reasons for doing that since most of their profits come from outdated, outdated products that are not very pro-consumer. Uh, and as they digitalize, uh, they will capture less value. Uh, but of course, their customers will capture more. So ultimately, this is all pro-consumer, uh, uh, even though we're going through a difficult transition from A to B. Uh, this is the second 50, uh, a little bit less progress to now, it's important to note that this is consumer-driven they're focused on here. 
right? That to me is super exciting here. Customers will capture more so. Ultimately, this is all, you know, BlackRock at the top, the Goldman Sachs, right? The JP Morgans, all of them that said they're not working on it. Well, they're working on it. And guess what else? Not only are they working on it, listen to the central banks talk about we had to adopt distributed ledger technology or risk becoming extinct. I think we can work on this and really we can take enough time. I think we do not have this time. We have to really, as I said, to speed up on all this because otherwise, if you would have asked me, I know it is recorded. <laughs> if you would have asked me, if, if you would have asked me 20 years ago, is the central bank business model really, is it destroyable, yes or no? I would have said clearly, no. Now I'm not so sure anymore. And this is the reason, and that is the reason why we are sitting here. We have to work on our business model. And, DL, and DLT is just a mean, or for, it's, it's an instrument that could help us here to really get to that point. And this is exactly what I've been saying, and Subjective Views is saying the same thing as well here. And we've been saying it for years here on this channel. The central banks out here, the, look, the problem this time around is not like 08, 09. That was a real estate default swap crisis, right? They kept repackaging bad ideas and bad products, and they kept repackaging them and making them bigger and making the products bigger and then packaging the bad stuff with the good stuff so it looked better and just kept repackaging and selling it to each other it was embarrassing. But nevertheless, the problem this time is not a real estate default swap crisis. The problem this time is a money printing problem. And it is at the doorstep of the central banks. So there's no one for them to turn around and put a hand out to. They are the one that hand out. And they know that printing money will not fix the problem. Because printing money is what in large part has brought the problem. So this time they're looking at things like distributed ledger technology and such because of the efficiency it can bring. Not to mention something that doesn't get talked about a lot, velocity of money. Understanding that we're going to see a large amount of dollars come back home because of the de-dollarization campaign around the world with BRICS Coalition and others there is going to be a need and a requirement to have the velocity of money work in a way that has never worked before, where you can move money around the world faster than ever because there's going to be so much of it that needs to move around. This is the problem, and they know it, and that's why they're preparing for it. Relevant, power, and control. That's all that this is about. Here you're going to hear more innovation here talks by Chief Innovation Officer of SWIFT, Tom Zischak here. I want you to hear what he says. There'll be a unified ledger, but it won't be one to rule them all. And boy, wait till you hear what James Wallace says. Important distinction. Um, we love the ideas of the unified ledger. Me too, um, Tom. We love the idea of moving kind of beyond messaging. We think that, you know, there's real drivers for that. Uh, tokenization is a really important part of that. So, you know, as the world becomes, you know, looks at new digital assets, new digital currencies, whether that's a CBDC or it's a tokenized uh, commercial bank deposit, you know, there's drivers for change and there's good reasons to do that. Um, and we think there's multiple ways to do that. Uh, the unified ledger, even though it's unified, I think we can all safely say there's probably going to be more than one. Um, there might not be a thousand, uh, but there's going to be more than one. And I think everybody easily agree that's that's healthy. Um, and, that's and it is healthy, and it is coming. Oh, boy, and is it coming. Now, I want to take you through this, and I'm not going to play the whole thing, but you need to hear most of it, and I'm going to start right here. So this is an update on Project uh, Enbridge. So let's go back to what Project Enbridge is. It is a shared payment infrastructure that uses CBDC, in particular wholesale CBDC, 
of the participating central banks to achieve instant cross-border payments. So having listened to the panel just now, a lot of the concepts that they talked about, wholesale CBDC, one platform, interoperable by design, settlement finality, two-tier, atomic settlement, that's what we're seeking to achieve with the Enbridge. Now that sounds a lot like the XRP ledger, doesn't it? But keep listening. Um, it, the core system does not use XRP. Mm -hmm. right? It is it, we're using the same technology that is with the XRP ledger. What we, the token would be the CBDC, right? So mm -hmm. the central bank would actually create their own token, a digital euro, a digital dollar, whatever the, mar the market is, um, and that becomes a digital asset. As the native um, coin. The native coin, yeah. Now, yeah. where where XRP could come into play potentially is when you're looking at cross border. CBDC. So when you have a digital dollar and you have a digital, you know, real, you know, or digital digital pound, you, know, you obviously need to have some some way to interact cross border. Yeah. Listen. So I think the, the uh, BIS called this a multi CBDC model. Um, the, the, uh, one of the ideas is you use a sort of a neutral bridge currency to go from one to the other, similar to the model I explained earlier, where with our on demand liquidity. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the yeah, but the core offering really is is not. XRP. There's no XRP involved. It's, it's the native token is the CBDC. There you have it. The native token is the CBDC because you don't need to be forced to use something like the uh, XRP token unless it helps to make the transaction better, more efficient. You're not forced to use it. That's the way it should be, right? But now that narrative has been turned negative. Keep listening. Talk to me a little bit more about that opportunity you see with central banks. What kind of conversations are you having? Uh, lots of conversations with lots of central banks. You know, I think 90% or so of central banks around the world are evaluating CBDCs. Um, we, we sort of view CBDCs as one of many digital currencies that will coexist in the world. So, you know, as a company, we're, we're talking to central banks about CBDC. We're also talking to commercial banks about what they will do with CBDCs. Um, we're also talking to commercial banks and other institutions about stable coins. And then, of course, we're, we're renowned for being in the crypto space. So uh, we view all of these different digital currencies coexisting. And, you know, we, we'd like to be involved in all of them. What clients do you have right now? So right now we have several clients. We've announced four. Uh, today, actually, in parallel with this announcement, we announced that we're working with the HKMA in Hong Kong. Uh, on building out a real estate tokenization platform with CBC. Uh, we also have three other projects, one with the Central Bank of Montenegro, um, and then two others. One is with the Central Bank, uh, the Royal Monetary Authority in Bhutan. And then the final is with Palau, which is um, a republic. It doesn't have actually a central bank, so they're having, uh, we're working with them to issue a government-issued stablecoin. You just mentioned four jurisdictions that are very different from each other. Talk to me a little bit about why you're choosing to work with these uh, governments first. Listen here. Um, well, as I said, we are working with some of those that we can't talk about yet. As I said, we are working with some of those that we can't talk about yet. <laughs> There's a lot more coming. And, you know, if this is anything to show you that might be a speculative lists per se confirm ripple partners from the list you can go down it right here shout out to smoke dog for this one showing uh all these different central banks here and the list is just crazy long going to mr man's list here too bank of italy bank of israel bank of korea bank of nambia uh central bank of bahrain central bank of chile uh, Egypt, Jordan, Central Bank of Malaysia, Nepal, Norway, uh, you know, the list goes on and on. And yes, it also does include the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and others. You know, that's what we're talking about, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I want you to imagine getting the legislation necessary, the regulatory clarity necessary, that all of these banks and financial institutions can come off of the sideline and start using this technology broadly. Think of that for a moment. You're going to find out very quickly where there's a place or a demand to solve a problem. And you know what? I think that's where you're going to start to see some builders and developers show up in a very big way to start to solve problems inside the new financial system 
that have yet to be discovered because it's new, right? So that really is exciting to me, and all of this is exciting to me. And I have one more last clip here that you absolutely need to see. And I'm not going to play the whole thing. I'll take it right up to the end here. And you're going to hear Mr. James Wallace here say, well, let's stop thinking like a loser and start thinking like a winner and get with the program here. I love this message. Take a listen here. Therefore, I mean, what, what is your all view on uh, what could be a commercial model for CBDC? Is there one? Uh, as we heard, it must be offered for free. Um, and uh, also in the rulebook discussion and other discussions in the design principles, there are certain incentivation. So, so what is your what is your view from from bank perspective or other uh, perspective on what could be a commercial model for retail CBDC? Or is there one? I'll have a crack at it. Um, <laughs> but I think just to preface that, I think the, there's a fundamental question really, which is, you know, what's the role of the central bank? And if it's to say the same as it is, right, in this commercial bank, central bank money is, you know, um, reserves and cash, right? So a lot of central banks are looking at this as, oh, this is going to, it's just replacing and improving that, right? I, I, as I said before, I don't think that's really the right answer. I think the, um, the longer people study and the more complicated they make it, uh, the more expensive it's going to be. So I would encourage speed over total precision, right? And I think the, I still believe this blend of uh, public-private is the answer, right? I think the, you know, the central bank should do what they need to do at a reasonable cost and not burden everyone else with that cost. And then, you know, the innovation and the competition will come from the private sector, right? So. Um, some will offer a bare minimum and say, okay, well, you, I'll, I'll, you can put your CBDC in my name the bank wallet, right? Or they'll say, okay, I'm going to offer all these other uh, services in competition with my other banks, right? So I, I don't know where the commercial answer will be, but I think given that it's pretty much inevitable that there will be some form of public digital money, it's just get over that, right? Just assume that's going to happen, you know, make the central banks do it in a reasonably cost-effective way and then just listen to this have at it in the open market and see what happens i think there's there'll be winners and losers right and that's what makes people nervous because they think oh maybe i'll be a loser right well okay why don't you just think like a winner and then you maybe you'll be successful <laughs> somebody put those thug glasses on james right there for dropping it like it's hot Maybe just think like a winner and you'll be a winner instead of a loser. Yeah, that's a great way to think, James. And I love that you're able to say it so beautifully with that accent. It softens it a touch. But I tell you, the message hits just as hard as it should. We're going into the Freedom Zone. It's digperspectives.com, ladies and gentlemen. That's right. Oh, you're going to want to join us in the Freedom Zone, ladies and gentlemen. Boy, I tell you what, we're going in here, and you need to hear about it. Are billionaires hogging all the money of the world? Well, we're about to find out here. Uh, join us in the Freedom Zone, too, digperspectives.com. It's not financial advice for me or anyone else. Uh, great way to support the channel for next to nothing. Just go to digperspectives.com, click on the Freedom Zone, and come on in. We're doing that right now. Come on.